Hello, Gurgaon. Wonderful to be here. Before I hit JNU, let me tell you, I hit the streets of old Gurgaon and spent two years of my schooling life here when they used to have a bus that was specially to take us out of Gurgaon to study to Loretta Convent and the Delhi Cant. So those are some of my lovely memories of uh, Gurgaon with peacocks are plenty here. It wasn't so glitzy, but it was certainly a lovely, relaxed place to be in. So it is my privilege today to have such a wonderful speaker and a brilliant author. That is the book, and ever since I've got it, I've been reading it. I still haven't come to the last page, but like Murder Mysteries, I quickly went to the last page to see <laughs> what it was that he had to say. And I think that what he has said in the book is important for all of us to ponder on, because we are not that very far. And I'm not talking only about geographical distances. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite Thant to come onto the stage. We've had uh, Pyle introduce you, and I will just add that uh, he has uh, not only he heads it, not only does he head the Rangoon um, Heritage uh, Trust, but also the Youthant. Uh, what do you call it? House, the Youthant House, which is not really like a think tank, but for discussion purposes. And Indian authors have been going there and speaking very often, having seminars. And I think we're going to enjoy listening to him because of the many similarities in what's happening in Burma and where we seem to be headed. My first question to you really is uh, from the cover of the book. You have chosen to write in red the name of your country and you have chosen to write it as Burma and not as many people pronounce it today, Myanmar. So my first question is about that, uh, you know. First, let me just say it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and, and, and to speak to you here this evening. So I'm very grateful to the, to the organizers. With the book cover, I'm not a cover designer, so the red is, it wasn't actually my, my choice, um, but I think it looks very nice. And, and I think with Burma, I, I did struggle with it a little bit. I mean, but Myanmar is the more common word that is used uh, in English in the country now, and it's the, it's the official name of the country. But I suppose my main reason for using Burma is just that I prefer it it's a personal preference. I, I like the sound of, of Burma better in, in English. It's, it's what I've used in all of my books up until now. It's the, it's the word that I grew up with in speaking um, in English about the country. And in Burmese, I mean, Myanmar has always been the name of the country, but I think the change of the name from, from Burma to Myanmar in the late 1980s, early 1990s, really came from a, a very specific sort of nativist view that I think hasn't been all that good for the country, so there's a little bit of that. But in general, I think it's, it's a personal preference as much as anything else. Well, I think that's as good a reason as any other. This conversation is also important because, you know, over the last 20 years particularly, although in one of your articles, you call it not a day, single day of rest or something like that, but definitely over the last 20 years, I don't know how many of you have been able to get the right chronology of what happens in Bangladesh, uh, sorry, in Myanmar, Burma. Uh, and we wonder whether, um, are we doing it too simplistically in believing that it is a conflict of binaries, a conflict between dictatorship and democracy? Pyle also highlighted the democracy aspect. But Thant makes a very persuasive argument to look at a more complicated, more nuanced plexus of of reasons why, uh, w what is, why things are happening the way they are in Burma. So you have raised a series of non-democratic, non-dictatorship arguments about the way things have been panning out in Burma. Amongst them, you have cited climate change, you have talked about race conflicts, you've talked about the drug industry, which is a multi billion dollar drug industry, you've talked about uh, China's industrial revolution, and you have talked about something that India is experiencing, which is the proliferation of hate speeches on uh, social media. So what is the real reason? Yeah, I don't know how much time we have to go over all well, of those different things, but, <laughs> but maybe I think maybe the place I would start is this. I mean, you know, we, we all know, obviously, in the room, the, the partition of India uh, in the 1940s and the creation of Pakistan. But I think a lot of people, even people in India, forget that you know, British India was first partitioned in 1937. 
and Burma was created as a separate entity uh, in the British Empire in 1937 after many years of, of, of struggle and, and demands by a new Burmese um, political movement or political movements uh, that saw Burma as a different country from the rest of, of India at the time. And whereas Pakistan was created in 1947 with this idea of religious difference, Burma was created in 1937 on the basis of this idea of racial difference. And this idea that the British had, that the Burmese were racially distinct from the rest of the people of, of British India and were a different people, was something that was internalized by the Burmese. And in, and in many ways, I think many Burmese people also saw themselves as being of a different civilization. So this play with race, is it a technique of uh, colonial divide and rule governance? I mean, it's always easy to blame everything on, on, on the British. And I, I think that, you know, on, in the Burmese case, there was obviously a, a different sense of identity of the old Burmese kings and the Burmese kingdom. But in colonial times in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, modern European race science, I think, gave a lot of um, weight to ideas that had been around and, and really crystallized thinking about racial and ethnic difference. And so with the partition, with the separation, and then independence in 1948, the Burmese came to see themselves as the inheritors of an age-old civilization that had always been distinct. But the problem for the Burmese since 1948, and this is really the seed of almost all of the problems ever since, is then defining what the boundaries are. And so this idea accepted, I think, by almost all Burmese, that the Burmese are different from the Indians, but where is the line? And within Burma, you have many other languages, you have many other uh, religions, many other uh, identities other than the Burmese. So deciding who is indigenous and who is foreign, who belongs and who doesn't, has been really at the heart of very contentious and often very violent uh, Burmese politics uh, since independence. Um, you've talked about climate change that has exacerbated the issue of racial differences and privileges to some communities within them. Uh, in climate change, given the fact that half the world's leaders don't believe in them, why are you pushing this issue? Is it truly a reality or is it... I mean, it's a couple of different things. I mean, one is that whether or not it's climate change, uh, Burma has undergone severe environmental degradation over the past 25 years. Since the economy began to open up to the outside world, uh, since trade with China and Thailand in particular, cross-border trade has increased. Uh, millions of acres of, of Burma's forests have been cut down. Uh, and there has been uh, severe, again, environmental degradation accompanying uh, economic change in the country. And this has led to uh, the migration of millions of people, uh, especially from the interior of the country, uh, eastward towards Thailand uh, in particular. Uh, this led to Cyclone Nargis in uh, uh, 2007, uh, which killed, uh, sorry, 2008, Eight. which killed 140,000 people in a single night, uh, which may not have uh, happened or may not have had the same uh, impact if it hadn't been for the environmental uh, degradation of the Irrawaddy Delta. And now what we have is climate change. We have uh, much less predictable uh, rainfall patterns. We have many more weeks, if not months, of extreme heat in the center of the country uh, where the poorest people live. Uh, we still have the out-migration of people from the Irrawaddy Delta. Uh, but Burma is likely to be, together with Bangladesh, uh, one of the countries, one of the larger countries, not the Pacific Island states, but one of the largest countries uh, to be hit by climate change over the coming decades, not just rising sea levels, but extreme heat, uh, changing rainfall, all of these things will the change mean... change in rainfall is particularly important because rice economy of Burma has historically been very important. You know, the, uh, the Shan people who came to India and uh, sort of found their base 700 years ago in Assam brought the wet, wet right cultivation, rice cultivation with them. So um, our food reserves falling... Is, is poverty measured in, in the lack of food? No, I mean, so far, I mean, with the, the good news is that over the past 10 years, with economic reforms and with economic change, I mean, poverty has decreased in absolute, uh, in absolute terms. Um, but what it means is that Burma is still a very poor country. It's still the poorest country in, in Southeast Asia. It's lagged behind for many decades. It's a much, you know, whereas uh, 50, 40 years ago, Burma and China were more or less the same in terms of per capita GDP. Now China is five or six times richer. So Burma has lagged behind. And with the coming impact of 
climate change, Burma will have nothing like the wherewithal that neighboring countries like, say, Thailand or certainly Singapore uh, would have to deal with what's to come. And what's to come is going to come not just in you know, 50 or 100 years, it's going to come in 10 or 20 years' time, at a time when Burma, again, will be extremely unprepared to deal with, uh, with the impacts. You mentioned China, and in the book you refer to the Chinese Industrial Revolution as the biggest industrial revolution in the world. I know that the numbers of Burmese uh, tigers have been decimated because of the demand from uh, um, China. Now, what has been this tremendous impact on Burma because of China? It's everything. I mean, as many of you may know, Burma was isolated from the rest of the world. It was a socialist experiment, Burmese way to socialism, which ended in 1989. Uh, after 1989, the economy was liberalized. The border with China was opened up because of Western sanctions that also meant that Burma wasn't integrated into world markets. So Burma's trade became overwhelmingly with China. China produces almost all of the uh, consumer goods, or, many, or the vast majority of the consumer goods consumed in, in the country. Even Burmese sandals and lungis are produced in China and, and shipped to Burma. It has de-industrialized uh, Burma over the past 20 years. China has also consumed huge amounts of raw materials, uh, primary commodities from timber, uh, to other commodities uh, in Burma, meaning that the economy of Burma, for better or for worse, I mean, many people have, have profited from this and there are farming communities that benefit from exporting to China. But what it means is that Burma is far more integrated into Chinese markets uh, than any time in modern history, at least. Uh, and now we had a visit of President uh, Xi Jinping to Burma, the first Chinese leader to come to Burma in 20 years. And China wants to build uh, the equivalent of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. They want to build a parallel China-Myanmar uh, economic corridor, uh, which would be valued in the tens of billions of dollars, which would tie Burma that much more tightly to the Chinese hinterland. So as an Indian, my next question comes that, you know, in uh, geostrategic terms, there's China on one side and there's India on the other. What are the efforts India is making to it's counter? A it's a completely different geography, because for, for China, the, the province uh, that's next to Burma is Yunnan. Yunnan is a little bit smaller than Burma. It's about the size of France, uh, slightly smaller in population, about 50 million people, I think. Uh, but Yunnan is much richer. It's industrializing. Uh, China has spent tens of billions of dollars in infrastructure since the fiscal uh, financial crisis of, of 2008, 2009. And so for China, it's all green lights. I mean, they want Yunnan to be that much more integrated with uh, the Burmese market. Uh, China has uh, a lot of influence over what we call ethnic armed organizations, but, insur uh, but essentially insurgent groups uh, along the common border. Uh, whereas for India, it's Northeast India. And Northeast India is a relatively poor part of the country. It's detached from the rest of the country. It's conflict ridden itself. So the possibility of India projecting its influence and its economic influence across Northeast India into Burma is simply not the same uh, or comparable. Uh, to the position that China is in. And of course, China is a country with huge state-owned enterprises. Its capacity to project that economic influence and power, if it wants to, uh, I think China is in, is in many ways in a league of its own. In the northern uplands of Burma, where the forests are dense, uh, in colonial maps you find that territory marked as unadministered. I suspect that it remains thinly administered even now because uh, many of the insurgent groups of India find their home there, keep their roots moist there. And given the present state of uh, un unhappiness and unrest in, uh, um, the, in Assam, I don't think it would be that difficult to imagine that there could be a revival of insurgency I mean, we are at an inflection point, and this is going to impact India as much as it's going to impact any other country. Uh, Burma, if you look at the, a map, Burma is about one and a half times the size of France. In about a third of the country, there have been insurgencies over the past 20 or 30 years. Sometimes these groups have ceasefires with the government, sometimes they don't. Uh, we are home to about 20 different ethnic armed organizations, the biggest of which has uh, over 25,000 troops, the United Wa State Army. We have over 1,000 militia in the northeast of the country, outside of, of government control, controlling territories outside of, of, of government control. There are two new insurgencies. One is the Arakan Army, mm -hmm. uh, which has gone from just a few hundred men to 7,000 men over the past couple of years, indirectly perhaps tied to China. 
which is now pushing south into Arakan, what is now called Rakhine State, and pushing towards the Bay of Bengal. So the map of Burma is changing, the insurgency map of Burma is changing, the question of whether the Burmese government, the Burmese security forces can deal with these new insurgencies in this new age of democracy or semi-democracy is a huge question. And whether Burma goes from here towards some sort of sustainable peace, or whether Burma goes from here to a situation of greater armed conflict and instability will have certainly a direct impact on Northeast India, uh, as well as for, for other countries in the region as well. Let's come to the worrying picture that you paint, and worrying even more so because roots that often see um, uh, insurgencies see the transfer of arms, the trafficking of drugs, the trafficking of human beings. Now, drugs I know is a reality, but what about arms and human beings? I mean, you have this entire, yeah, I mean, you have a part of, yeah, if you go to Burma today, you go to Rangoon, you go to Mandalay, and it seems quite stable, and it is very stable in many ways and very peaceful, but you go just 100, 200 miles away, and you have this landscape, this patchwork of different militia and insurgencies, as well as government army battalions, and these are places where, because this has been a situation, not for years, but for decades, you have all sorts of illicit industries that are able to thrive in an environment where there isn't necessarily day-to-day -day war, but there's also not peace and no law and order. And so the drug industry, and in particular the last couple of years, the methamphetamine industry has exploded and is estimated now by the United Nations as worth over $60 billion a year. So it's the biggest single drug industry anywhere in the world with methamphetamines produced in Burma being shipped out uh, to places as far away as New Zealand, Australia, and Japan. Now, the exact links between the methamphetamine industry and different insurgent groups is not fully known. It's a very difficult thing to investigate. Uh, but this is also part of the same sort of landscape where you have illegal uh, weapons trafficking, as well as human trafficking, uh, wildlife trafficking, and other illicit industries as well. But this is where the Burmese state, even though it's been a military dictatorship for a long time, uh, is actually quite a weak state in many ways, and has never really had a grip on these uplands, uh, these areas which the British barely administered, but which no Burmese state uh, since independence has administered either. This seems such a <laughs> dreary part of our conversation that I rapidly want to move to something a little more hopeful, and uh, the sunrise part of it, uh, which is uh, the hope of democracy that was um, kindled with Aung San Suu Kyi, for instance. Talk to us a little bit about what led to that. What, was it that she was at the right she was the right icon at the right time in the right place. I mean, there are a lot of mythologies about what has happened in Burma over the last 10 years. And part of the reason I wanted to write the book was, was to uh, demythologize uh, the story of, of Burma, which did transition from a pure military dictatorship in, in 2010 to the sort of semi-democracy that we have now, where the army still has control of 25% uh, of parliament, uh, but where we do have an elected government. And, and this is something that very few people expected, um, say 12, 15 years ago. Uh, at that time, Aung San Suu Kyi and many other people were locked up. There were thousands of political prisoners. We now have much greater political freedom than at any time since the army took, first took over in, in 1962. But the reason that happened isn't because of the pressure of Western sanctions. The reason that happened isn't because of different international policies. And the reason that happened isn't because of a grassroots re uh, revolution either. It's because a specific group of Burmese generals decided that they wanted to move to this new system for their own purposes and for a whole mix of different personal motivations. For my book, I interviewed uh, over a dozen different generals at length to try to understand what made them do this. And what I found was that, and you'll see if you read the book, it's for a whole different range of very personal motivations as much as anything else. Uh, but what that meant was that it created a space into which uh, Duan San Suu Kyi was released uh, in 2011. And she, having become this incredibly popular icon, both internationally but also domestically, was then able to win uh, a landslide at the elections in 2015. So the hopeful part is that Burma's democratic transition uh, has gone forward. Uh, and there's every reason to believe that we'll have elections later this year, that there'll be free and fair elections, perhaps the freest and fairest, at least in our immediate uh, neighborhood, if you compare with a few other countries in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, but next to that is this unfinished uh, civil war in the country, these issues of identity, uh, the coming impact of climate change. 
and the one thing we haven't talked about yet, which is extreme economic inequality now in the country, uh, which is the product also of the last uh, couple of decades. So I would like to talk about that, particularly in the wake of the fact that yesterday or day before Oxfam released a report about India, which talked about such glaring inequities, 1% having the wealth of over 70% of Indians. So is it a situation like this? Are there lessons for India to learn from the Burmese example? I'm not sure what the lessons would be to learn from the, from the Burmese example, except to say that you know, in, in, in Burma, I think you know, we, we moved into, from the socialist to a capitalist economy in the, in the 1990s. That had some benefits for some people, but it did lead to this exploding inequality that I mentioned before and all kinds of different uh, social uh, problems uh, as, as, as well. Um, but people's hopes were for democracy. Democracy was held out as, uh, the, the, as the sort of miracle uh, that would then deliver a better life for everyone. And in a way, it's great that we've moved towards a more democratic government, we have more political freedom, but it hasn't been linked to the economic issues. And I think the central problem in Burma right now, of, of many different and very deep problems, is this disconnect between economics and politics. Uh, that there is still this push for democratic change, but it's de-linked from any real thinking about the political economy in the country and what the future of the Myanmar or Burmese economy should be in the 21st century, given China next door, given climate change, given inequality. And I think unless we have a vision of the sort of economic future, the sort of political economy, the sort of society we want to be, it's very difficult to give content the sort of nascent democratic institutions that we actually have at the moment. Wasn't that evident early enough, after all, Western sanctions, which were in any case, you know, a little uh, sort of tokenistic because they kept the oil part out of the deal, eventually ended up hitting the poorest of the poor in Burma. And when the demo democratic speeches were being made, there was no reference to institutional changes that would talk about egalitarianism and would try and push that, including by Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, because we had a very thuggish military junta in charge. It was very easy for people to say that democracy is the answer to, to Burma's problems. And because the democracy movement was repressed, jailed, locked up, people went into exile, there was no debate and discussion about what kind of future the country could have. But now there's no excuse. We do have a more free society in Burma. And I think what would be wonderful would be at this time when I think we're all in a similar boat, not just Burma and India, but many other countries in the world as yes. well, uh, to have a much more joined up debate across borders about what kind of you know, remainder of the 21st century we want in terms of economic outcomes. I mean, whatever happens, Burma and India will be much more connected in the decades to come and then in the decades past. I mean, in our grandfather's time, uh, Burma and India were the same country. And I have every reason to expect that in the decades to come, the connections will become tighter again after a long hiatus. And so I think this joined up discussion about what democracy should mean beyond the normal sort of votes and electoral systems and things in the 21st century, given social media, given technological change, but how that links to a very clear economic vision, I think is something that we can have across, uh, across international borders and between Burma and India in particular. So the fault lines that exist around the world between uh, democra what democracy's idealism is and what, how democracy is playing out, uh, Burma is a wonderful example of uh, where, we, it could be the, the crucible in which we yeah, can I find mean, answers. I mean, I mean, Burma is both a warning, yes. because we went down a nativist, isolationist route uh, 50 years ago, and it was understandable there were huge issues with migration in the country. There were huge issues w about uh, the impact of colonialism. And so it was understandable that people wanted to retreat uh, and that certain nativist ideas came to the forefront. But what that led to was 50 years of relative economic decline and intellectual impoverishment. Today, because in Burma things are so fluid, there is the opportunity to experiment. And there is the opportunity to think afresh about, because we have these nascent institutions, because we are at an inflection point in so many different ways, to think in a very fresh and dynamic way about what the future of democracy, but also what the future of issues like identity should be, and what a poor country like Burma can do, uh, given uh, the climate change to come. Um, in uh, India, 
we are dealing with issues of migration, clean forgetting that at some point of time, when the GDP of Burma was high, there was a huge Indian migration into Burma. At one point of time, 7%, you, you mentioned that figure in your book, uh, of the population, entire population of Burma was of Indian origin. And they included the money lenders, the Chetiars from uh, southern India. Yes, I mean, I think people often forget. I mean, this was one of the greatest human migrations of, of modern times. And, and at, in the early uh, 20th century, uh, up to two million people from the rest of British India migrated to Burma every year at a time when the population of Burma was just 13 million. Uh, Rangoon in the 1920s rivaled New York as the greatest immigrant port in the world. And these were sometimes very poor people from Orissa, people, uh, Tamil and Telugu speaking, uh, laborers who came uh, to work in the cities, especially in the factories and the docks in Burma. But they also included people from all across the Indian subcontinent who simply wanted more opportunity and a better life. And, uh, but this worked in a certain way for a long time, but with the Great Depression in the 1930s, uh, ethnic and racial feeling and differences became an enormous part of the new political landscape as well. So this, this idea of how to deal with uh, migration and the identity politics that came up as a result of it in the 1920s and 30s has really been at the core of, of Burmese political DNA ever since. Sand, I'd like to come to now the big elephant in the room that we haven't addressed as yet, which is the Rohingya refugee crisis. Could you give us a history of how it happened, what are the phases in which it happened, and what are the possible solutions? Yeah, it's very difficult because, you know, I think uh, there's a history, obviously, but sometimes history is used as an excuse um, as well. But the history is basically that you have an area, what is today the Bangladesh-Burma uh, border, the Bangladesh-Arakan border, uh, which for hundreds of years was a, was a frontier as well as a backwater, uh, which in the 19th century was inhabited mainly by extremely poor people, some of whom spoke a uh, dialect of Bengali, some of whom spoke a dialect of, of Burmese. Um, and during World War II, the two sides, uh, the two communities fought on different sides. It was violence, thousands of people were killed. There has been enmity ever since. Um, and under military rule since 1962, this area has been neglected, it has become poorer and poorer every generation. Tensions between these communities have increased. Uh, Is this it because the resources are reducing? Yeah, it's partly that, and it's partly because successive governments have done nothing to try to integrate these communities or try to encourage these communities to live peacefully uh, side by side. And instead, there has been a lot of political manipulation from the outside that has, if anything, uh, kept these communities apart in their own imagination as well as, as well as physically on the ground. There have been successive attempts to to uh, successive uh, security crackdowns in the 1970s and 1990s, which led to original early uh, refugee exoduses to, to Bangladesh. And then when we had our democratic change in 2011, in this more open political environment, we had the first communal violence between these two groups that we had in a while. And that could have been uh, locally sort of ignited, uh, but it's also very possible there was outside manipulation as well. So hundreds of people died, uh, tens of thousands of people were displaced, and that is the origin of the, of the current uh, Rohingya crisis. In 2016, 2017, uh, an insurgent group uh, emerged, a militant insurgent group, the Rohingya, uh, the Arakan uh, Rohingya Solidarity uh, Army, uh, which then launched attacks on, on government positions. And it's the army's response uh, to those insurgent attacks, especially in August and September of 2017, that then led to hundreds if not thousands of civilian deaths, uh, the burning of hundreds of, of villages, and this dramatic exodus of 700,000 men, women, and children into Bangladesh. Many of whom are staying in Cox's Bazar Many of area. Whom are, almost everyone who's left is still there, yes. And the stories that come out of them is much worse than just economic uh, based issues or ethnic issues. It is human rights abuses of the worst kind. Yes, but this is, I think what is important to understand is two things. I mean, one is that this is in a country which has been at war with itself since 1948. This is a country in which the army has fought multiple insurgencies for 70, 80 years, brutal 
uh, insurgencies and counterinsurgency operations of the worst kind over 70 or 80 years. And this is a country where the army, I mean, there's no other country in the world where an army has fought literally nonstop uh, since the 1940s. So what I'm saying is that, you know, this is happening in an already brutalized uh, context. Uh, and where I remember in 2016, 2017, before this exodus happened, there was also a great paranoia about this particular insurgent group, which was seen as an Islamicist new terrorist threat. And it was played up in this way. Uh, the Burmese were new to social media. We went from 2% or so uh, telephone use to 98% uh, smartphone use over a few years. Uh, Facebook went from non-existent to the platform that was used by almost everyone in the world. There was a lot of hate speech on social media, but there was also a lot of paranoia on social media too. So there was both this steady drumbeat of we must do something against this new terrorist threat. Uh, you had an army that had been fighting brutal counterinsurgency campaigns for, for decades, and then you had ARSA attack uh, 30 police posts in an army station in one night. And so uh, it would have been surprising in a way, this is not an excuse for what happened, but it would have been surprising in a way if there hadn't been a very forceful army response. But yes, the, the army response has led, even the government's own uh, commission is now uh, admitted to uh, what would amount to war crimes, not just severe human rights abuses, but war crimes. Uh, and has led to the flight of, of 700,000 people, nearly half of whom are children, and who are now stuck in these camps in, in Cox's Bazaar. And Bizarre. the largest refugee crisis in the world. Yes, the largest refugee crisis in the world, which has no, I think, very little sign of, of, of being addressed anytime soon. Because what is not known by many people is that on, on the Burma side of the border now, there's a whole new insurgency uh, by the Arakanese or Rakhine Buddhist minority there, the Arakan army, uh, which has gone from strength to strength and is involved in intense fighting now uh, with government forces uh, very close to the Bangladesh border in the Bay of Bengal um, as we speak now. I have very little time left because the second bell is going to be the final bell where heads roll after that. <laughs> but uh, my last question to you really is, uh, can we hope uh, from Aung San Suu Kyi that she will lead us into uh, over the next decade into a hopeful Burma, or, or is it a, there is no other alternative I think for that. me in writing the book, the, the, the difficult thing was trying to decide whether to, to end on an optimistic or a pessimistic note. I mean, the pessimistic side of the ledger is, you know, all the things that we've discussed, the, 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 the armed conflicts, the, the racial animosity, the climate change, the inability to manage uh, China's uh, overwhelming influence next door, the weak institutions. But on the positive side, we have had more political progress these past 10 years than ever before. It is a country of tremendous uh, potential. It sits right at the crossroads of Asia. Uh, you have a young generation that is better educated than before that desperately wants to join with the rest of the world and wants to do the right thing in their country. So it's very difficult to know, but in that way, Burma really is a test. It's a test for uh, what is possible in Asia. And if Burma, as the poorest country coming out of isolation, can succeed over these next five, ten years, then I think many other things will be possible as well. So I think we'll end it off on a note of hope by saying, if Burma is the, pro is the crucible where all the worst and vexing problems of the world exist, maybe the answers will also come for the world from Burma. Yes. Thank I you for so. this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much.